This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Did you watch the videos of the horses running? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I didn't see there was another article where someone was like, this is what spooked the horses and I didn't didn't read what it was. I didn't see that. Do you think they were spooked by being like exploited by a horrific (laughs) racing industry? (laughs) Maybe that spooked them. I don't know how many people outside of Queensland would have caught this one this week somehow, even though it's such a beautiful story. Well, somewhat sad ending. But from the Seven News article we're talking about, so it opens, it's one of the Gold Coast's most iconic events, thoroughbreds galloping gracefully across the sand of Surfers Paradise Beach as part of the Magic Millions barrier draw. But for two horses, the spectacle on Tuesday morning presented an opportunity and they took it. As the beach race was being run, garnering almost exclusive attention of the hundreds of onlookers, the two riderless horses were filmed leaving the beach area. (laughs) It's unclear why the horses were without their jockeys. They trotted up a road before trotting through the glitter strip, then ending up at the busy Gold Coast Highway. The joy run sparked a pursuit by authorities. After taking several twists and turns through Surfer's Paradise, the horses ended up on Sunset Boulevard. And like... Which that's, I think that's the best image for me is them just like trotting around surfers, just like looking in like, what's that shop with all the condoms? Condom kingdom. And they're like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Love this. And the police just rolling around. Yeah. 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 They got them in the end. The police just rolling around saying to people like, have you seen some horses? Yeah. (laughs) And the horses are just like. Having the time of their lives. Yeah. 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 It was, it's definitely liberate. I recommend like for folks who haven't seen it, looking up the video and feeling that spark of joy when you watch them just like galloping away at for like, do they just kind of trot away and you're like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freedom, freedom. (laughs) Freedom at last. Like free them. They obviously don't want to do the dumb run. No. Magic millions of horses running free forever and Mm, ever. mm. (laughs) Yeah, just turn the turf club into a big park. Much better outcome. Yes, turn everything into a park. That's our policy. (laughs) (laughs) This party is the nastiest skank bitch I've ever met. Do not trust her. She is a ugly slut. Frankly, I've always found the Greens to be a real serious danger to Australia. A serious danger to Australia. Well, hello, everyone. This is Serious Danger in the new year. First proper episode actually recorded in 2023 because the previous ones were fake recorded in 2023. Uh, I don't, you might have noticed that's not Tom's voice. I'm Emerald Moon, but that's actually Amy McMahon, the member for South Brisbane who is co-hosting while Tom's away. Thank you, Amy, for doing this. Thank you for having me. It's very exciting. We've been meaning to have you on to the unofficial, the non-official Greens Party podcast for a long time. Obviously, the usual housekeeping stuff, the podcast is made possible with the help of Green Institute and produced by Michael the Griff Griffin. And I have a few patrons, new patrons to thank. I'm sorry if I've missed anyone because it's been a while since we've properly recorded, but new patrons, we have David, Sebastian, Saga, Dylan, John Balls, Alan, Bushwoman? Bushwoman. I would like Buswoman. That would be good. That's Amy. She catches the bus. Um, Holly, Malachi, and Ashley. Thanks for being patrons. We, yeah, we definitely like we hit a little bit of that that target. We did that drive towards the end of last year, but we need to keep growing the patrons. So if you're not a subscriber already, please consider chucking us three bucks a month so that we can pay Michael and continue doing the show. We love you very much for it. This week on the show, we have a couple of things to talk about that Amy loves talking about. We're going to talk cost of living and supermarkets and how we stop broccoli and other essential foods being so expensive. And then we're talking Olympics, the 2032 Olympics in Brisbane and principally within Amy's own electorate in South Brisbane. Keen to get into it. Sounds good. I mean, it's one banana, Michael. What could it cost? Ten dollars? You've never actually set foot in a supermarket, have you? I don't have time for this. So the important the important question to ask Amy, where do you shop? Do you go to Coles, Woolies, IGA? I go to Woolies um, only because yeah. there's a new Woolworths right around the corner from where I live and it's very convenient. There's, you know, the bottle shop, the chemist and the Woolies 
and we were we were committed Coles um, shoppers when we were kids. <laughs> I actually didn't know that there was like other supermarkets and <laughs> until I was like in my, I don't know, late, late childhood. I love that. Well, oh. you'd be, yeah, you're worse off for being a Woolies shopper apparently as of mm. this month or mm. whenever Woolies ended their price freeze because this was this was in the, the news this week. I mean, it was clearly, I should preface this by saying this was like 100% a pure PR exercise that obviously mm. Coles had probably pitched to News Corp. They ran this article that was like, Cost of living's going up, but the price freezes are ending. Woolies had already ended their price freeze where they'd locked a few essential items at lower prices, um, even with inflation rising, cost of living rising, and Coles was meant to end theirs at the end of the month. This article ran that Coles was ending and it's all terrible, and then the next day Coles is like, actually, guess what, guys, because we love and value our customers so much, we're going to extend that price freeze beyond the 31st of January. So they still have one and Woolies doesn't, which obviously looks bad for Woolies and good PR exercise for Coles. Absolutely. Who are, who are famously a very <laughs> benevolent organisation. Well, They're yeah. just there to look after your bottom line so you're not getting slugged at the checkout when exactly. you go there with your veggies and your groceries. I mean, that's what you would think reading the articles. <laughs> Coles is extending its price freeze pro- program in right. a win for Aussie shoppers, yeah, yeah, yeah. staring That's down right. the barrel of soaring inflation and interest rate hikes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you, I mean, did you notice the price freezes? Like, do you reckon they made any difference to your shop? I didn't. Um, yeah. I, I have noticed things getting more expensive, uh, like uh, mm. as most people have, my, my, a lot of things getting more expensive. But yeah, I, I, wouldn't have noticed if the the price of particular things were staying steady, um, and I think that's partly because the cost of everything was was going up, which is you know something common that a lot of people are experiencing. Yeah, yeah. They apparently like I don't really. I wonder how they chose what to freeze. I think mm. they froze like flour, sugar, oats. Interestingly, eggs, mm. tea, some meat, cheese, bacon, and nappies. So just like really mm. basic things. Mm. But yeah, there was I. I know last year I think the um, ABS started releasing the the monthly like inflation data mm. and they released the data for November this week and it showed that CPI again was up, it was up 7.3% over the year to November in 2022 mm. and in particular really big increases in food and non-alcoholic drinks, so 9.3% yeah. for those. Mm. And something like dairy up 13%, bread and cereal mm. up 11.8%. Mm. So, yeah, it's pretty massive. And like did you say like, do you have people, you know, particularly that you've noticed contacting you as an MP saying that they're struggling to pay for groceries? Yeah, just people struggling with the cost of living in general. Yeah. That combined with the cost of housing has put a, a lot of people right on the edge and we regularly get people getting in touch who just need a, something small to tide them over till the next mm. fortnight. Um, mm. Or they need some groceries or they need, uh, you know, a Coles or Woolies voucher or something like that. And just a lot of people commenting like, yeah, the, the cost of the cost of this, the cost of dog food, mm. the cost of these other basics is going up. Yeah. And it's because, I mean, I guess maybe you have, uh, I'm keen to hear your take on what the reason for this is. As I understand it, the generally accepted consensus is like it was or or is sometimes to do with the pandemic, so like supply chain mm. disruptions and particularly, yeah, people getting sick and being unable to work and, and unable to deliver goods or unable to source them from somewhere else. The war in Ukraine impacting costs of fuel and, and transport, and I think that particularly has really big impacts on cost of food and, and essentials for people in remote communities mm. in particular. Mm. And and the other one that's interesting is like climate change I, I think I missed this at the time, but I was reading about this that, yeah, in October last year, I, around the time of the budget, the federal treasurer was saying, oh, yeah, the flooding over the across the East Coast, which, yeah, we have been seeing more flooding, is mm. going to push inflation above 8%, he said, for fruit and vegetables over the next six months. Yeah. Which is an interesting thing. Like, obviously... Yeah, you did. What did, what did you do? What did you actually do your PhD in in terms of impacts of climate change? Did you look at food security? Yeah, I was in the south of Bangladesh, which is yeah. one of the most climate impacted areas, cyclones, floods, salinity, and I was talking with mainly women farmers about how they were being affected by climate change and mm-hmm. talking with them about 
how their their growing and selling was being affected by the various different environmental challenges that were facing them. Um, yeah, frequent flooding, massive cyclones, knocking out their production, knocking out roads. And then, you know, we see the same kind of thing happening here, massive, massive yeah. floods coming off, you know, past years of drought, potentially heading into drought-like conditions again. Um, that's definitely had a big impact on um, the supply of food and and the, the cost of food as well. And I think the, the main factors you've mentioned there, uh, yeah, climate-induced disasters, the war in Ukraine, a general other costs going up, interest rates and other costs that are being absorbed by producers and suppliers. Um, but the other big one is price gouging by yeah, um, these, these big organisations. Coles and Woolies make billions of dollars in profit, billions of dollars. So keep that in mind. When you, when you get to the register and they've got that little thing that's like, do you want to round up? to give to mm. um, to fair share. Just think, why don't they put some of their billions of dollars of profit into yeah. um, these organisations or why don't they be reducing their costs of goods to actually help people? But ultimately mm. they're businesses and don't forget that they're, they're, a, they're a duopoly. Like they control something like 70 to 80% of all food in Australia goes through one of those major supermarkets. We've got a few other players who have come in, but most mm. people shop at Coles and Woolies. And so when yeah. Coles and Woolies say, oh, we're, you know, we're blocking prices on things, it's like, yeah, well, people don't really have a choice yeah. uh, about where they get their food from uh, because they're just this massive, such massive power over the food system. And not just in terms of selling food, Coles and Woolies have these supply chains that go back to the farms. So exactly, they're often, they're, they have these big contracts with, Farmers often are undercutting farmers and then they're controlling every uh, element of the supply chain along the way. And they would, mm. they have these big warehouses where food is coming and then they're sending it out. During the 2011 floods, there were some really incredible stories of rural towns that were running out of food and there were trucks full of uh, food that were waiting to leave to head to Coles and Woolies depots. So rather than turning around and yeah. giving that food back to where it had been produced, that food was was heading out to a, to a Coles and Woolies depot and probably then coming back to that town in some form. Yeah. And also during those big floods, the army was, was brought in to helicopter food in, um, but it wasn't free. It was food being helicoptered into Coles and Woolies for people right. to go and go and shop. So, the yeah, the army being used... As a as a supply chain tool for yeah. these these major corporations, yeah, um, it is and so wild. you know they they command a huge amount of power, and yeah, they make a huge amount of profit off what is like you know one of the most basic things um, yeah. that people need. It is it's funny, yeah. Like obviously, yes, everyone needs food, and that's why I I think you and I have talked or like I am certainly really interested in the idea of yeah treating food as an essential essential service and essential good in the way that, you know, we as as democratic socialists or like in the Greens, we talk about things that you need to live your life should be, mm-hmm. well, if not free, they should at least be publicly owned and mm-hmm. things like electricity and, um, and, and housing and healthcare where like they should be publicly owned. But for some reason, making food part of that isn't really part of the general consensus yet. Like it's seen as as mm. very radical. It's something that not a lot of people are talking about is bringing, mm. yeah, for example, supermarkets under public ownership, but something mm. that I'm very interested in. Like have you looked at, into this much before in terms of whether it's been done elsewhere? There are some examples of supermarket chains that have some kind of state stake in them, mm. in uh, in some Scandinavian countries, obviously happens very commonly in third world countries. There's like lots of state distribution of food um, in Bangladesh, for example, that I observed. People can go and um, and get their their basics if they've got some kind of concession card or mm. or a widow card or something like that. But yeah, but here nothing. Logistics would be very difficult. Yeah. 
And part of the reason why Coles and Woolies are able to keep things cheap is because they have these very, very lean uh, supply chains and, you know, they're undercutting everyone from the farm to, uh, you know, the teenager who's helping you at the checkout. Or the robot. Yeah, or the robot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like your yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. The robot that now videos like your face. Yeah. And then they're obviously taking their cut as well, which would be eliminated in a state-run system. Um, it would be very difficult, but there could be some cool ways you could could do this. I have been following a fellow called Callum Kent, who's a, a trade unionist in the UK, doing a lot of work with like um, delivery drivers, and mm-hmm. he was talking about the idea of like a state-run like food delivery system. And he was talking about how the workers get treated obviously really badly, but also that these companies then have huge amounts of data on what's going on in a neighbourhood. And um, he was making the point that like you can sort of tell like when someone's depressed or like someone's having a hard time, maybe if they're ordering a lot of of takeout and they've got a huge amount of data on, you know, people's habits and what's going on in a neighbourhood. And how could you utilize something like that for um, for a social good? Say you leave hospital and you know you're you're going to be off your feet for six weeks. Could you get a voucher that's like you'll get hot meals delivered to you uh, twice a day for mm. six weeks? Or maybe you've just had a baby, or you've come out of prison, yeah. or something like that. How could we utilize some of those like existing networks to provide a, a social good to be delivering food to people? Or, you know, boosting up some of the other kinds of alternative food networks, like how do you make heading to the markets like an actually viable thing for people? It's often yeah. quite tricky. Timing is difficult. At times, yeah. more expensive. You know, could you, be, you, could you be giving people vouchers to head down to their, their local um, fruit and veg market and helping communities set up more kinds of food distribution centres around the place? So that you're not all converging on Davies Davies Park markets down at West End on a Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah, and like kidding yourself, I think I was talking to someone about this recently, how I feel like a lot of people, especially, yeah, like white middle class people at some point in their lives went through the phase where they were like, I think it would be efficient for me to shop, get my groceries at the farmer's market. I'm going to do mm. this. Mm. And you really kid yourself being like, yeah, this is this is great. This makes sense. Like, for me to do this and eventually you realize it really does not like it is expensive and difficult yeah. and there's a reason that everyone yeah. has to shop it at the supermarket so yeah yeah, and, yeah I mean even though I think that there's little push for or I don't know what the public response to a call for like a, a state-owned supermarket would be I, I think generally it is oh we just need to support small local producers more which is it mm. is fair enough, but I'm still I'm intrigued by the idea of mm. yeah a bigger a bigger kind of operation. I I know like I imagine that I think there were probably you, you know there would have been state owned supermarkets that are now defunct like in informally communist um, jurisdictions. Mm. But there's one I, I saw when I had a quick look at this. There's like a union owned one in Singapore that was established in the 70s again to to respond to yeah rising cost of living and, and inflation mm-hmm. it seems like the peak the the union body i guess maybe the the equivalent of like the actu mm-hmm. over there owns this and still owns this supermarket and it it's like expanded into a bunch of other areas it's called fair price i think in mm-hmm. in singapore i i'm not sure how yeah to what extent like it genuinely operates as a cooperative now that's owned by the union but it's it's interesting and i've seen it considered as well I've seen the Polish government maybe a couple of years ago was saying that they would look at at starting up a state-run mm. supermarket chain, not mm-hmm. not like nationalising the whole sector, but just having a mm. state-owned supermarket to to compete. Which is yeah, like obviously to buy out Coles or Woolies would yeah, be yeah yeah yeah, it'd be tricky, <laughs> very difficult. Although yeah. I've I've heard some some folks be like, well, why don't we buy out Aldi? Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. The people's mm. Aldi. The people's Aldi, yeah. yeah. Like it, it, it is because obviously, yeah, there's, I mean, there's the reasons that, that Aldi as a particular kind of, uh, plays a particular role in the market, has like a limited range mm, mm. and maybe wouldn't work as something that is a genuine alternative, you know, mm. genuine competitor from from the state, but somewhat. And 
yeah, it's it's something that I'm that I'm interested in. The the other I saw, I think they had an inquiry in New Zealand into like the supermarket sector recently, and there was a a report that came out like um, from that commission of inquiry that made a few recommendations for regulatory changes, but mm. it it fell short of anything really kind of significant or or radical. Mm. And there was this mm. conversation article. That came out after that, that that called for, I guess, for a bit more of a radical approach, which is like to regulate supermarkets as public entities in a way. Mm. Did, did you see? I I think I shared this article at, at the time. I can't remember if I sent it to you. It, it was basically it was like you could do a few specific things, like for example, restricting the activity that these supermarkets can can carry out. So like prohibiting them from acting as wholesalers or manufacturers as well. So like if you're mm-hmm. going to be a supermarket, mm-hmm. you are a point, yeah. you're a retailer. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. not actually yet yeah, undercutting those manufacturers and, yeah. and, and wholesalers and just doing everything Coles brand or whatever the their, mm-hmm. um, their no brand brands are. And you could set fixed and publicly stated margins. So mm-hmm. make it a lot more difficult for them to, to price gouge, which mm-hmm. I think yeah, I mean, I would definitely back something like that. Like, yeah, yeah, and start with those basics that they've already demonstrated that they can sell quite cheaply. Mm, uh, start true. with those things and be like, okay, there's there's some kind of limit on the price of these things and um, and you need to, yeah, cut your control back to the farms and let the farmers have control and, you know, let the farmers work cooperatively as well mm. um, to be to be providing those goods. Yeah. Something like that could could be quite cool. And I think like the cost of living issue is not going away, you know. Yeah. The treasurer uh said like that inflation would would tip 7% by the end of the year. It went beyond that. I think we got to 7.9% in Queensland. Um mm. and with those other big geopolitical elements still going on, what could we be doing domestically to genuinely bring down to bring down inflation and to bring down um, the cost of living, and I think food and housing would have to be two of the the key areas where mm. you could have a have a deinflationary impact if you were putting controls on some of the prices of basics. Yeah, yeah, and I know because I I think I saw in that latest inflation data it was like yeah, obviously housing continues to be a a massive mm. issue, and I think like maybe slowing in some areas in terms of of inflation uh, in the housing sector, but. The the article that I read, this is maybe a bit of a tangent, but it was like there was some good news in in the inflation data, including a reduction in the number of owner occupier purchases of of new homes. And I was like, that's an interesting measure. Like, how is that a positive thing that there are fewer people getting into their own? Does that imply that there's more more investors who are yeah, kind of fueling that kind of turnover of houses. Yeah. Maybe they're like, oh, since it's not owner occupiers, there'll be more rentals. Like it's that kind of logic. Yeah. Which, if yeah, so, yeah. 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 Which is really like, yeah, this idea of like the benevolent landlord. Yeah. Like, oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Mr. Landlord, for uh, for letting me have a roof over my head while I fork mm. out hundreds and hundreds of dollars to you every week. You're so sweet. Mm. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you reckon, because I certainly think that, in terms of areas that the Greens should be looking, because obviously, yeah, as you say, cost of living, it's a, it's a mess. It's probably the number one issue on people's mind at the mm. moment. And if we're looking at areas of focus for the Greens as a political movement, I think something about, yeah, addressing the cost of food is a, a major, like, it's a political thing to tackle in the sense of that thing where you need to make it uh, make it appear possible to people that a government mm, could do mm. something about yep. the cost of food at these at yeah, these yeah, supermarkets. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there does seem to be a growing awareness that privatization of all sorts of uh, essential goods has failed. Mm. Um, you know, this idea that that governments run things really inefficiently and um, mm. really expensive kind of still lingers a little bit. But when you see the kind of price gouging that you're getting with your electricity bill or with petrol or with housing and also when you go and get your groceries, I think mm. people are recognising like, oh, yeah, this privatisation has failed yeah. um, and and we're, you know, seeing all sorts of repercussions coming from that. Um, and then I think breaking down this idea that like, yeah, governments run things really inefficiently, It's it, that is not... The, that doesn't have to be the case and maybe yeah. it has been in the past 
but it certainly doesn't need to be the case. And I think the more democratic engagement you're folding into any of these big institutions, the better they're going to be. I mean, there's lots of models where you have make sure you have workers on the boards and um, and introducing these more cooperative models as well that run much more efficiently than organisations that are just uh, run purely for profit. And, uh, yeah, could we start to seed the idea of doing something like this in the food space? Yeah. Which could, could be really exciting alongside all those other measures that we know would be really good, like having urban food and community gardens mm. and pharma cooperatives and decentralised models of, of food production um, as well, looking at sustainability measures. Like one of the most energy intensive parts of the food supply chain is your own journey from your home to the supermarket and home again. Mm. You know, unless you're getting your food delivered or you're, or you're getting it on your bicycle. Yeah. What are some other ways we could we could do this to make this a bit more sustainable yeah. as well? So yeah, I this is something I I would I would love to explore this a bit more. I think it's definitely at the more more radical end. It's mm. it's perhaps even more radical than you know the Greens have talked about um, renationalizing a whole range of things, bringing you know mining for example. That's Mm. That's pretty controversial. We've talked about yeah. um, bringing private hospitals back into yeah. to public hands, seeing the, the the massive failures that we've seen in um, in the, the private hospital sector and the public hospital sector that relies heavily on having a, a private sector. Lots of public money that's being funneled into the private hospital sector. You know, what are these other? Where are these other big institutions that we could be bringing back into public hands? Electricity is a big one. You know taking back all the toll roads, yeah, train lines, all these things privatised by not only the, the LNP but Labor as well, particularly yeah. here in Queensland. Um, we have a history of Labor engaging in privatisation. They mm-hmm. like to try and forget that history but, you know, they sold off the roads, they sold off the train lines, forests, ports, mm. parts of the electricity system as yeah. well yeah. and and we're paying the cost. We've never had uh, any kind of public food institutions here in in Australia so it's kind of like new ground mm. but I think there are some really exciting opportunities here also thinking about like rural communities who are getting massively price gouged for yeah. the, the cost of transport you know you see these appalling articles in Indigenous communities where people are paying you know huge amounts of money for basics mm. for for you know the most basics groceries for nappies for things that people really need and people out there they really don't have a choice where else mm. do they go and you know you yeah, exactly. go fund me's pop up all the time i think yeah um mornington island late last year was like they pretty much ran out of food and um yeah and they were having to to wait a really long time for when the the next boat would come in and having to rely then on organisations like Food Bank and Fair Share to mm. get to get food in when the private institutions failed. Yeah, the irony of it all. Mm. What would um what would you call a publicly owned supermarket if we had one? Oh, uh, I always just think of like the People's Grocery Store or something. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, yeah, kind of simple like that. I think uh, we we often talk about the People's Audi, but I don't know if you could. Um, yeah, that would you be take a take a take a take a private name. I don't know. You could call it like the the people's pineapple or something like that. <laughs> yeah, if it's in Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Amy. What do you have planned for 2032? I will be down <laughs> outside whatever stadium the Olympics ends up being held in, standing with the people, mm. holding some kind of protest line, most likely. Your calendar's full. Yeah, you're, you're a big planner. You plan ahead, Amy. That's right. Um, That's right. Uh, Amy likes to plan at least 10 yeah. years in advance. I've got two weeks that just says protest to long bar <laughs> in my calendar. Yeah, yeah. It's important to plan ahead, as the Olympics always do. It's been... I guess so it was, yeah, almost two years ago or it was sometime Mm. in 2021 that Brisbane officially won the bid to host the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games after much, yeah, kind of buzz about the fact that we were maybe going to get it and we were bidding and then we we got it. 
And it's in particular, a lot of the new venues or the infrastructure that is slated for the games are planned in your own electorate of South Brisbane. Lucky mm, you. Mm, you that's get to right. That's right. Replace a local park with a warm up track. You get mm-hmm. to demolish a an existing stadium and probably a school next to it for a new stadium. That's right. Are you incredibly excited? <laughs> this has been, yeah, like incredibly frustrating. Um, I might just go back to, to start with the bid. Yeah. The state government sort of in about 2018, they were like, why don't we host the Olympics? They never asked anyone. They did a little bit of phone polling. And the question they asked ah. people was, would you support the Olympics if it meant you would get better public transport? And they got, <laughs> a, they got a positive outcome on of a phone course. poll. That, that's the extent of the consultation that the Queensland government wow. has done with the general public. And uh, so they rolled ahead. They pushed ahead. They said Brisbane's putting in a bid. It wasn't really a bid. No one else bid. It was just Brisbane. And cool the ways in which the decision-making about who hosts an Olympic Games changed recently at the hands of John Coates, who is the head of the Australian Olympics Committee and on the International Olympics Committee. And he changed the way um, he did it, uh, the, the way the bids happened to lock in a city quite far in advance. And wouldn't mm. you know it, after he changed the rules, the first place that gets locked in is Brisbane, 11 years out, which is quite yeah. a long time. Usually Olympic Games only get locked in about seven or eight years at a time. Ah, okay, I didn't realise that. No one else put in a bid. It, it wasn't like we beat anyone. No one else wants it. <laughs> you wouldn't know it from the way that, like, the – Palaszczuk in particular acted about it. The International Olympic Committee has the honour to announce that the Games of the 35th Olympiad are awarded to Brisbane, Australia. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, holding up a little thing with Brisbane. Like there was one there was one card in the box and it said (laughs) Brisbane and they pulled it out. And other cities don't want it. There is a growing awareness of the problems of the Olympic Games and other cities aren't interested or they go to their, their communities and they do a ballot and the community says, no, yeah, uh, we never had that chance here in Brisbane or in Queensland. We've never been asked. Yeah. And um, the government are pushing ahead with this, yeah, as, as you mentioned, potentially at the expense of a local school, a local park, and other big infrastructure um, that will happen around the place. Mm. And, you know, is it worth it? It's, nope. it to, to me, it certainly doesn't, doesn't feel like it. I recognise a lot of people yeah. really enjoy the Olympic Games. Absolutely, people enjoy mm. watching it on their TV. Do they want it in their own city? That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I And, like, I'm keen to – I want to come back to, yeah, the specific kind of infrastructure projects mm. and what mm. the impacts of those are going to be in – you know, on, on places in, in your electorate and how people feel about it. But it's, yeah, I mean, the consultation thing, first of all, I just thought it was really funny. The, I remember when you asked the premier about this, about why they didn't do any consultation and it was the premier, right? And she was like, well, it was in the media. I think (laughs) people would have heard about it. Yeah. 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 She said, oh, we've done a lot of media on it like that. I mean, that, that really encapsulates Queensland's labor approach to consultation. They really don't care. Like they don't, care about asking people they don't care about you know what people actually think about it they the Labor Party even don't even care about what their own members think either um no. there was an article this week about how <sighs> at the the recent Labor caucus the the party's mm. position is to move towards decriminalization of marijuana yeah and the like the parliamentary wing are like nope <laughs> and yeah. it's like okay it's- so you <sighs> yeah you don't you don't care about like everyday Queenslanders you don't care no. about your own base your own members uh, like, like what can you imagine being a Labor member? I just, this is one of those things where, yeah, even when people talk about change with change for within and mm. they're like you manage to get through the process of, of becoming a delegate and you go to your state council and you, you're fighting to form the policy platform mm. and you get something in there and mm. it means absolutely nothing. Like I wish mm. that people understood that Labor's policy is not their policy. Their policy mm. platform is mm. not what they do in Parliament. Yeah, that's, mm. it's quite mm. wild. Like they, they yeah. actively have voted against what's in their policy platform. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's a whole other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A reminder that, you know, the political class and uh, your political representatives tend to be much more conservative than the general public. Yeah. Um, you know, most people you speak to are like, yeah, corporate profits are bad or, yeah, mm. like legalised marijuana, like 
no problemo or like, yeah, we should yeah. be fully funding our state schools and, and hospitals and yeah. uh, we should have high royalties on, on mining companies and phasing out coal and gas. And the biggest roadblock is the political class and mm-hmm. the people in positions of, of political power. Yeah. And we see this time and time again. Yeah. Well, anyway, yes. But <laughs> we have to <laughs> that's the mandatory uh labor rant. Yeah, but well I think and to- I think the Olympics <laughs> is an example of this because the only people who seem genuinely excited about this are the politicians. True. And the Olympics <laughs> is often used as uh, there's this term sports washing and it's a way of like distracting people from other things that are going on. It's a way of mm. uh saying that we're doing all this great investment in like in uh, you know bits of infrastructure or in, in public transport in service of the games um mm. and so you know we should feel really excited about it but it's worth remembering like no olympics bid is ever like a grassroots thing like there's never been a yeah. city that's like that you know there's like a plucky little group of people being like let's band together and get the olympics yeah 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 started at a pnc like <laughs> yeah 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 exactly yeah it's it's it always comes from um from the political class who know that they and their friends are going to make a huge amount of money out of this yeah. um and often sports is um is not the core business of the olympic games it's property mm. development it's corporate sponsorship, it's media, it's advertising. Yeah. It's the big construction companies that are going to cash in on um, on big white elephant infrastructure. Yeah. And these are the same people who are donating to the major political parties. Mm-hmm. What a coincidence. You know, who are circulating in these same circles. You know, it's the same consultancy companies that are, that are going to get the contracts to, you know, write these dud reports to say that the Olympic yeah. Games is great. Yeah. And then and then, you know, there's a revolving door of, of politicians ending up in these organizations. And they go work for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I'm, ongoing speculation about, you know, various government ministers who will find a, a secured long term job somewhere in the sports or Olympic arena after this. Mm. Interesting, because yeah, you would have you would have been reading a lot of examples about this. I know you you told me you've kind of been reading more and more about the history mm. of the games as an institution. I I guess, and I'm curious to know what you've what you've learned. What are some interesting things about the Olympic Games and mm. why they're maybe mm. not so great? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the um, most striking things is every Olympic Games since I think 1960 has run over budget. And um, there's no Mm. accountability whatsoever for what is expected to be a bigger and bigger and bigger event each time. Yeah. And governments uh, know they can use this as a bit of a smokescreen for other things that they were, that that are going on. Like Russia invaded Crimea shortly after the Sochi Games. So they were able to drum up a lot of like excitement, nationalist fervour. And a bit mm. of a like veil to be like, don't look at what we're doing over yeah. there. One of the things that happened in Queensland recently, there was a, a bunch of Olympic torches that ended up in Parliament and the Premier was down there with some school kids <laughs> with these torches, including a torch from the Nazi Germany Games. Yeah. And but she um, posted and was like, yay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And people were like, oh, it, it, is this the same torch you're talking about? Like... And, you know, these pictures from those games, which now look shocking. And one of the things I learned recently is that the round the world torch relay is something that was pushed and fostered for those Nazi games because they recognized that this was uh, an excellent um, propaganda tool, Mm. a way of um, showing to the world like, no, everything's A-OK here And, um, and we're all about like fostering some kind of harmony through sports and mm. use the relay as a bit of a, a bit of a tool for that. Yeah. And yeah, like since since the 60s this has really become more and more of a commercial venture and less about, you know, actually promoting harmony mm. or even the people who are actually doing the sport. Yeah, like- <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's imp- like it's important to remember that like the sports people are kind of, well, they're workers basically. Like they're yeah. not they're not involved in the bid. They're they're often not like making that much money mm. from uh, it depends on like other sponsorship that you might get but mm. like a member of the International Olympics Committee will make more money per day from the games than an Olympian often 
and you know they get put up in these beautiful hotels and Mm -hmm. um you know they they get paid to just like sit in the stadium and and watch whatever and there's lots of other people who make much more money than the sports people themselves who are what everyone wants to watch people log on and turn the tv to see these incredible feats of you know sporting achievement and excellence yeah but yeah it's it's kind of secondary um to yeah. what else is going on yeah it is just such a massive it's it's such a massive money suck like the expense mm. of these games is almost unfathomable when mm. you realize that and the attempts to justify it by kind of what like conjuring imaginary economic benefits out of thin air are just so remarkable. You were talking about the consultancy firms that will get paid to like write reports about this. And even I remember I had to do an events management course in uni for my degree. And it was the worst. I think it was my least favorite course I ever had to do throughout uni. It was so bizarre and awful. And when we did, yeah, I remember doing classes on the intangible benefits of big sporting events like the Olympics. And, you know, people don't often understand the the enormous long-term and unquantifiable um, positive impacts of, of hosting these games because they are unquantifiable because they're bullshit. Like yeah. the KPMG report that Labor commissioned in 2019 about the the economic impact of the games i saw i i got this off your website that they were saying that they estimate the games would provide queensland with 7.4 billion dollars worth of quantifiable economic benefits updated it to 8.1 billion but 3.5 billion dollars of that is social benefits which mm. includes civic pride like what does that mean how do you get billions and billions of dollars out of civic pride yeah, I, I I don't know. One of the yeah, there's there's all these things that they've put in there that you can't actually quantify in any way. Like yeah, are they going to be saying to people like, did you go to the doctor less because you were so happy that the shot put was happening down the road or something like that? One yeah, of the more yeah. egregious elements in that report is saying that there would be an uptick in the uh, uptake of sport. And that that would lead oh, yeah. to old people falling over less because they would yes, be fitter. Yes, I remember this. Fewer yeah. falls. And, yeah. yeah. And and the footnote like basically said like there's no evidence for this. Yeah. We're just speculating. Maybe. Um, Maybe though. Yeah. And um <laughs> and we do know that in that report there was meant to be a section that that was a social cost and um it never made it into the report. We know that there was a literature review written on um yeah the social and economic costs of the olympics and it never yeah. made it into that report so we get we have ended up with a very one-sided report that the government used to justify um the olympic games and yeah a lot of their claims are, are bogus like if you look at the mm. evidence from other olympic cities tourism gets a minor bump one of the things it does is it keeps people away who would otherwise come and mm. um, you just basically get a substitution effect. You get people who don't yeah, come right. because they can't be asked for the games and then you get the, the Olympics tourists coming in who don't, you know, go everywhere. They they kind of stay in the Olympics precinct, yep. they go to their hotel, they go to their games, they go to the restaurants that are within the Olympics precinct and often, as we saw with the Commonwealth Games down the Gold Coast, if your business wasn't in the Olympics precinct, you were fucked and mm. they had a really terrible time over that month. Mm. So the kind of tourism benefits aren't really there. The broader economic benefits often overblown, very difficult to quantify. Um, like one of the things yeah. they say is like Queensland will get more trade afterwards, like to to be able to uh, coherently connect that with the Olympic Games is very, more people will very know difficult. Of Brisbane? Like, yeah, is more it people just know like, about Queensland. Yeah. So yeah, like, they're okay, like, yeah, we really, cool. yeah, we want those pineapples that, you know, will hopefully yeah, come from the people's pineapple have. shop, you know, <laughs> if we get that in a decade's time. One of the other big claims is that people will do more sport. Um, there's little to no evidence that people actually take yeah. up sport from watching the Olympics. So actually, there's some evidence to suggest that the everyday person watching an Olympian feels like, oh, well, I can never do that. So why would I bother like getting on my bicycle mm. or That's interesting. it's much better to the, the cities that have seen an, up, an uptake in sport are the cities that have also invested in like free sports courses for kids and, and other things. But there's, there's little to no evidence that the Olympic Games themselves actually, you know, improve people's health yeah. in any way. There's definitely some civic pride, like a feeling of excitement. You speak to anyone mm-hmm. who was in Brisbane during Expo, a lot of people who were in Sydney mm. during the, the during the, the Sydney Games, 
people do talk about a feeling of, you know, just like positivity and excitement and this mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, this big party that's going mm. on. Let's just throw a big party then. You know, does that justify <laughs> billions and billions of dollars? Does it justify yeah. the infrastructure that sits unused afterwards? Mm. Does it justify the massive disruption to the city for the period of time? And in the case in Brisbane, does it justify closing a school yeah, and closing yeah. a park and acquiring homes and the other, you know, the massive costs that, that well, Brisbane's going to bore? Does the, does the report look at driving up housing costs? Like does it look at, at the impact on the housing market? Because that's one thing that I know we've been talking about yeah. a bit so far. That's the other big thing. No, it doesn't, doesn't touch on that at all. Okay. And one of the big things with every Olympic Games is huge mass development, gentrification, driving up house costs and people being driven out of their neighbourhoods. Mm. A lot of Olympic cities will use the Games and say, we're going to eliminate homelessness by the time the Games come around. Okay. And, you know, there's some particularly terrible examples. like Meaning get them off the street. Yeah, yeah. Like in China there was like a million people displaced. Yeah. You know, uh, similarly in Tokyo – LA had the games in the 80s, massive, massive displacement of people. Mm -hmm. And they're they're going to host the games again, I think, in 2026. And they're basically seeing the same thing happen again. Mm -hmm. You know, low-cost communities, people being priced out of their homes. And a lot of this goes hand in hand with increased militarization of the police force. Cities will Mm -hmm. often use the Olympics as a justification for um, beefing up police powers and also giving police technology, that mil- military technology, yeah. basically, that is often not rolled back after the Olympic Games. You know, they don't go back and be like, okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna take the <laughs> take the guns off the police, yeah. and so we end up with uh, like a ratcheting up of militarization of the police force, which goes hand in hand with displacement. When you know you've got homeless camps being moved on, and we know this happens during during the the um, Gold Coast Commonwealth, Commonwealth Games. Yeah. Like people who were sleeping rough were giving were given a bus card and told mm-hmm. to head over the border down into New wow. South Wales, and you know, but but it was basically just like a sanitisation yep. activity. It wasn't actually about making sure that people had somewhere safe to live. No. Any investment, you know, often people will say the um, the Olympics villages will turn into public housing afterwards. It's mm. not the case didn't happen for the Commonwealth Games. Um, the government here are kind of equivocating. The language is very clever. They say we'll turn it into housing, <laughs> private housing yeah, could be anything. Yeah, exactly, yeah. As opposed to actually committing to say this will be like accessible public housing, which like that would be a genuinely good outcome if they were like we're going to build this beautiful, accessible mm. accommodation for athletes that is designed to then be long-term accommodation it's all accessible, it's disability friendly, mm. it's going to host the, the Paralympians straight after the Olympic mm. Games. We have a huge opportunity here to be building some really beautiful bits of infrastructure. At this stage, the government doesn't seem interested in that and they really have dollar signs in their eyes. Yeah, and they are like, I mean, equivocating on that. They're equivocating on fucking everything though. Like they mm. clearly, it's so vague. I mean, granted, sure, like it's 10 years out, but if you are going to, if you're going to spruik the benefits so much, then surely you have to have at least some details. And one of the biggest examples of that obviously has, has been this Gabba rebuild proposal. But there's nothing carbon neutral about knocking down a stadium and building another stadium. Where they would, yeah, knock it all down, probably knock down the school next to it and and rebuild the stadium. They were initially saying it could cost like up to a billion dollars. This week, the state government was admitting, actually, like we're already getting our first war out. So they're saying, actually, no, it'll be more than a billion dollars. And they're trying to get the federal government to fund it 50-50. But clearly there's negotiations going on there. They were like in meetings this week, maybe in meetings next week. The federal government's saying they're going to make a positive contribution. State government's saying it's going to be 50-50. Who knows whether they get that. But what people, particularly I'd say in your electorate, are most concerned about is why the fuck are we knocking down this stadium and am I going to lose the school that my mm. kids go to? Mm. Am I going to lose mm. my local park? Mm. Um, which you've been running a bit of a campaign about, uh, particularly with Max as well and, and, and Jono mm. a little bit, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah. So for people who might not be familiar with the area, um, the Gabba Stadium, which you, know, you might have seen like where the tests are played and uh, so they've got cricket, <laughs> cricket AFL, fans. other sports and like sometimes entertainment Mm. and 
it shares a block with a school. So, and mm. the, they've have both been there for about 120 years. They they're kind yeah. of about the same age. And obviously, when the Gabba started, it was just like a ring of grass and the school. And as the you know, as sport has professionalized and the infrastructure has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, the stadium has steadily kind of encroached on the school and the the last Mm. big redevelopment of the Gabba which happened about 25 years ago the school lost a classroom they lost part of their playgrounds ironically they lost like their cricket nets (laughs) and the Gabba has just gotten closer and closer and closer the promise was that the school would you know get to do their sports days at the Gabba and it really hasn't materialized it's Mm. been very difficult to get the the Gabba to agree to let the school do things there so if the GABA goes any further, the school is yeah. really going to struggle. And if their yeah. plans go ahead, which is to completely demolish to the ground and rebuild the stadium, a, a little school can't can't coexist with that kind of mm. massive, uh, you know, the dust, the noise, the trucks, the coming, going, the traffic impacts, safety for kids. They really can't coexist there. Mm. And the government seemed to have made the decision based on, you know, no evidence, no surveying, no conversation with the community, no um, no technical surveying on the ground that they're just going to forge ahead and they haven't given the school any clarity about what will happen. Mm. You know, they haven't said like, no, the school will be relocated for the period of the rebuild. You'll come back to some beautiful refurbished um, yeah. buildings or we're going to relocate you somewhere else within the electorate. You're going to get a beautiful new school. Um, nothing, nothing. Mm. Nothing <laughs> like no, yeah. That and we've been asking, like, if they had some sort of positive thing to say, mm. they would have said it, surely. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, they've had right. many opportunities right. to, yeah. and the fact that they haven't is very disheartening. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The and one of the biggest fears is that the school will be combined with another school outside of the electorate. It's a very fast growing mm. area. It's it's quite a not the electorate sorry the catchment mm, the, the right, school right. catchment's pretty pretty sizable It includes a lot of like working families the school is also like a foundation school for refugee kids they they often start mm. at East Brisbane State School where they have a specialised um, program for them before they head off to wherever the family ends up actually settling you know where are these families going to go and with the huge amounts of development that are happening in East Brisbane and Wollongabba and Kangaroo Point. All these new apartment blocks, which we know our families are moving into, this catchment needs a school, and we have no clarity. The, yeah. the the potential plan is that the Gabba will be knocked down after the twenty twenty five end of the cricket. Okay. So that's that's two years away. Yeah, and it takes about two years to build a school. So if their intention is to build another school, even a temporary school somewhere else, that needs to be starting today. Yeah, they'd need to have the land, and they'd need yeah, to have started the consultation with the community about you know what constitutes a school, um, and they hadn't done that. And um, they're really pushing ahead with this idea that the Gabba will work, even though you know it's not clear how they will fit more onto what is very constrained. It's got two major mm, roads that's a, yeah. on either side. It's got heritage buildings at both ends. How are they going to do this? And we've seen the the cost estimate go up and up and up. Um, the yeah. other element is that uh, an, an Olympics athletics field needs a warm-up track within approximate distance. The athletes uh-huh. need to be able to warm up and they need to then be able to get to the main stadium pretty quickly so that they're mm. still warm. They're warm. <laughs> uh, and um, this group called Populous, who the government have oh, yeah. commissioned to, to do some of the like early kinds of just like artistic work um, yeah. and are now doing a proper validation report. It really looks like they looked on the map and they were like, there's a park We'll just pop it there. <laughs> and this park is, the park's 100 years old. It's got 100-year-old trees. It's got uh, yeah. uh, the, the Kangaroo Point Rovers soccer club plays there. It's got a dog park. It's got a community garden. It's got playgrounds. It's one of the only big bits of green space in the neighbourhood. Mm. It's one of the few places you can really, like, kick a ball or, you know, there's a there's a cricket pitch at, at one end. It's really one of the, the only decent bits of green spaces in the neighbourhood and they've just gone, okay, well, we'll put the warm-up track there. And and from what we've looked at, from what a, a warm-up track, you know, there's some standard provisions for how big a warm-up track is and the kinds of associated infrastructure it needs. 
Um, they can't do this unless they uh, want to acquire homes, cut down, mm. establish trees, take out the playgrounds, kick out the, the soccer club. Yeah, destroy the park. And and from day one we've been like, how's it going to fit? And the government's like, uh, honestly, they've just been like, it'll fit. It'll fit. <laughs> don't worry about like, it. Like just don't, don't, don't worry about it. Yeah. Like, oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> They, yeah. So they announced that 18 months ago and they only sent out surveys to actually like measure the park um, yeah. in December. <laughs> and like, so, I'm yeah, it. it looks <laughs> We're just like, know. okay, like, yeah, it just sort of fits. And, and then, then when you consider you need um, fencing, you'll need security, you'll need parking, mm-hmm. where's all that going to go? And, you know, yeah. there's people who live around the park who are genuinely concerned that their homes are going to be acquired mm-hmm. and, and taken away. And then the government have said, and no problem, I will just rip it up afterwards and we'll turn it back into a park. I'm like, what's the point? Like, it had to have these these temporary facilities. Yeah, fucking hell. Unless, unless you're doing it very cleverly and you're designing it right from the beginning for how this is going to be deassembled and put together somewhere else or turned into something else. Like, mm. there are some really cool ideas about kind of temporary infrastructure, like mm-hmm. but turn it into a school afterwards or turn it into a library mm-hmm. or something like that. But, you know, there's elements of that park you'll never get back. You'll never get yeah. back those homes. You'll never get back those 100-year-old yeah. fig trees, mm. you know, to, to reestablish a community garden and a soccer club. Mm-hmm. All that takes time and, yeah. and it's taken 100 years to build the kind of community that exists around Raymond Park and the government are really willing to sacrifice that for, for a two-week event. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, the retort we often get is like, but your community is going to get all this infrastructure and you're going to get public, great mm. public transport. Like those are things we should get anyway. Anyway, yes. We shouldn't We'd have to. <laughs> yes, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We shouldn't have to. The Olympic Games shouldn't be um, the kind of bargain that we have to pay mm. in order to get some basic infrastructure. Yeah. And this sits alongside like it's very confusing rhetoric when the government are like, well, we we're going to build that. Yeah, the upgrade to the, the train line, the cross river route anyway, but also we need the Olympic Games to do that. And so, well, yeah, it, yeah, it starts, to, the justifications start to unravel a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, we were at, so I came along with you to the cricket a couple of weeks ago now, I guess, or maybe like a month ago, and we did a little banner drop at the day one of the the test about saving East Brisbane State School. And we were both, I would say, extremely nervous uh, because of particularly you, Amy, and this is like this is a good insight into why Amy is a good person and a good MP, but like really didn't want to interrupt or disturb anyone's uh, cricket viewing experience. You were like, I don't <laughs> want to be in anyone's way. I don't yeah, want yeah. to, uh, you know, like jeopardise anyone's uh, enjoyability of their day that's just trying to watch the cricket. But we dropped the banner and before or maybe shortly after being told to take it down by security, <laughs> the, there was this woman behind us who was like, what's your banner about? And you were having a chat to her about, yeah, losing the school and, and the impact of, of the, the stadium rebuild. And it was like a good, it was a good for, reminder for me that this, these are very valid concerns and, you know, something that actually the community really gets and and is on board with because yeah like yeah she was like oh that's that's absolutely awful I want to get in touch with you I want to get involved and and all of this so I think I I know and you sort of touched on this earlier and it's a dilemma that we've probably been grappling with a bit and, and you would have been grappling with a bit and greens in the area is like responding to the Olympics in a way that doesn't make us just seem like fun haters and mm, fun killers mm. who are like anti-sport and don't want anyone to enjoy themselves um, or feel proud of anything, which obviously is not the case. Like, yeah, it, yeah. yes, that's fantastic. We want people to to have a good time. But, yeah, maybe like drilling down into the really – kind of tangible impacts in the local community, which you can do as the local MP, mm. is a good way to start to like pull apart this this mythos around the mm. the benefits mm. of the Olympics as a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And it's worth remembering that this isn't just a um like a Greens struggle. This is coming from yeah. the community as well. Like there's there's a number of groups that have autonomously emerged. There's Friends of Raymond Park. Who have been mm-hmm. um, running events? They have um, nearly three thousand signatures on a petition, and they've been speaking to the media and doing lots of work to to get the community on board to let people know, like 
these are the impacts that are coming for for this community. There's the um, East Brisbane State School community who have been doing a lot of work. Mm. They have been um, surveying parents so that they have a really good sense of what the community actually wants. We helped organise a rally um, late last year that had hundreds of parents and kids and other community members who came down to, to rally for the school. On game days, they've been hanging signs up on the fences um, around yeah. the school. So anyone who's walking to the Gabba has to walk past signs painted by the kids that say, save our school, say things yeah. like, you know, 123 years of history over two yeah. weeks. And, you know, there were kids that day being like, I don't know where my little brother's going to go to school in a few <laughs> years' time. And, you know, this community feeling um, genuinely quite concerned. And they've got over 3,000 petition signatures as well. So it, I think it's important to remember, like, this is coming from the community. And a mm. lot of those people, when I speak to these parents, they say, oh, I love the Olympics. Like there's people who lived in Sydney during the mm. Olympic Games and they were like, it was a great time. I was a volunteer. Um, and a lot of them say, um, like, we should feel excited about this. Like they should, the mm -hmm. kids should feel excited. Like the kids should feel like, oh, you know, we're going to get to like be in the opening ceremony or we're going to get mm. to go and watch some sport or maybe like, you know, I'm really into diving. Like maybe I will think about like my a sports career. Yeah. But that excitement just isn't there when we're just being dumped on and told like mm -hmm. we'll sort out the details later and yeah. like literally don't don't you worry about that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just uh, I don't know how the government can straight face treat community like that, particularly the community that's going to be the epicenter of the games where you want people to be really excited, where you do want people to come out and volunteer, you know, you want people to be standing on the corner helping direct people, you want just like mm. a sense of excitement. But this community are like, we're going to lose a school, we're going to lose a park yeah. where um, our roads are going to be disrupted for years and years and years. We're potentially going to be priced out of the neighbourhood. There's massive amounts of development coming in. There's developers that are putting in um, development applications already saying cash in on the games we're going to have short-term accommodation. Uh, you know, it's going to be a great opportunity for you to be right, right near the games. Um, and people are looking this, look, looking at this, and going, "It's really not worth it." At, in the yeah. in the way that it's it's currently structured. Yeah. And yeah, I think I think that is really sad. Like the, these kids yeah. at East Brisbane State School, they'll be that you know they'll be like young teens by the time the games come around um, or in their, their early 20s. And, um, you know, that that is something that they, they should feel really excited about. Mm, yeah. And maybe, yeah, like I think that is potentially the challenge politically is figuring out how to present an alternative, as is often our, our challenge, a mm. kind of vision for what kind of, you know, what big events like this kind of where we do come together as, as a community, even across borders and mm. where we celebrate sport and celebrate each other, blah, 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 and do that in a way that is not inherently like exploitative, destructive, mm. bullshit, capitalistic yeah. Yeah. nonsense. Yeah. Maybe it's possible. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I think it's definitely possible. I think if the government were genuinely committed to um, doing some of the things that they say they're going to do, this idea of it being like carbon positive, like a genuine yeah, tool for, yeah. for like some kind of environmental action, if they were genuinely using this as a springboard to um, address homelessness and invest in, in public housing, if they actually came and did some consultation with the community, I think that would like really change the game a lot. And if they committed to what the, the Olympics now promote this idea of the new norm and the, 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 mm. the International Olympics Committee have recognised that like, yeah, there's these like crumbling bits of infrastructure around, like there's like alligators slithering down the the whitewater rafting uh, <laughs> place in Rio, like like it's not being used. Yeah. It's just... And they so they're like, okay, you need to think about what infrastructure you've already got, yeah. what can you already be using. Like, And we have some really great stadiums elsewhere. We have the Carrara mm -hmm. Stadium that was built for the Commonwealth Games 2018 mm -hmm. down the Gold Coast. Have it there. Um, you can have... You can have sports right across the, the state. Like there's a lot mm -hmm. of rumblings from, um, you know, rural MPs who are saying, 
what benefit is my community getting? This is a Southeast yeah, Queensland thing, like spread spread stuff out right across Queensland. Don't make it a Southeast Queensland thing. Make it make it a genuine Queensland thing. There's no even requirements to hold all the sports in Queensland um, or even in Australia. You could be like, okay, we're going to do the badminton like over in New Zealand, like yeah. spread it out a bit. The majority of people are watching the Olympics on the TV. They don't care where it is. Yeah, um, and not- we could do this cleverly. And I think actually putting in some accountability measures, like one of the big problems mm. with the Olympics is governments can say absolutely ev- anything and they yeah. know that either they're not going to be in power by the time the games come True. around or people will have forgotten their promises. There's no accountability to yeah. actually, is anyone being like, uh, is there actually more sports going on? Are there less old people falling yeah. over? Like uh, have their economic benefits actually materialised? Like putting putting some measures in place to have some accountability there and making sure that any of the decision-making boards have people from the local communities who are being affected involved in, in those decision-making, um, making sure that you've got everyday people who are having a say. And I, I think the other big one is like the cost, yeah. reining in the amount of the amount of money like as I mentioned, nearly every Olympic Games runs over budget on average by 172%. Um, that, that's billions and billions of dollars um, in yeah. public money. The additional costs are borne by the host cities. The, the, it's the public money. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's you know, that's billions of dollars that could otherwise be going to hospitals and schools and housing that will be going to the Olympic Games. There's some accountability measures the government could be putting in place. They haven't published their agreement with the International Olympics Committee. We don't know what's in there. We don't know what we've agreed mm. to. We don't know, Good. you know, what kind of fallback measures are in place. We don't know, like, yeah. once things hit a certain amount of money, then it's borne by Queenslanders. We don't know what they've promised the International Olympics Committee in terms of how much money them and their members will get, you know, the, the government have purposefully hidden communications between the like the Queensland Organising Committee and the International Olympics Committee from right to information. Open that up, have some accountability, um, and let people see what's actually going on. And then I think you know we could we could transform at least the way the Queensland Games are run. I think there's lots of things we could be doing down the track to make the Olympics better overall. We could abolish the Olympics, <laughs> or we could think like maybe it's in one place. The People's or Olympics. The People's Olympics. The People's Pineapple Olympics. Yeah, actually, there there is um, there is some history of like some like a workers' games that was going on in the 30s and 40s, and obviously mm. much less professional and and probably not televised. But you know, there there are some examples of like <laughs> some some yeah. people's games and other things going on. But yeah, I think yeah. there are there are ways we could do this. And and how could you bring the attention back to the athletes and the sports? Mm. Make sure the yeah. athletes are really well looked after, and make sure that every single bit of infrastructure that is put in does have a long term legacy. Yeah, and it is actually you know that that this stadium isn't going to then be knocked down in another twenty five years time because that doesn't <laughs> yeah. seem like a reasonable time frame for a stadium to me no, no. like surely you know big bits of infrastructure are built for 50 100 years they should be yeah there's a peace in our I think that we probably continue talking about the Olympics until it's on in 2032. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we probably, I think we're out of time. But if folks, for our call to action this week, I think even if you're not in South Brisbane or in East Brisbane, it's still a massive, uh, it, it's a massive spend. It's going to have massive impacts on on so many people. The flow on impacts in terms of, yeah, that big hole in the, in the budget uh, as it compares to spending on other infrastructure and services is huge. So if you do want to take action, there's a form on Max Chandler Mather's website opposing the GABA rebuild in particular. Uh, you can you can modify it as you like, but there's a form email there, so it'll only take a second. We'll put the link in the show notes. And if you are in East Brisbane or even like a little bit around East Brisbane, you can host a Save East Brisbane State School yard sign. There's a form on Amy's website that you can sign up. I'll put that in the show notes. Otherwise, thanks, Amy, for co-hosting. Tom will be back next week, I believe. But you know what's funny, Amy? This is maybe a cancellable uh, thing I've just realized for Serious Danger. But I think this is the first time we've had two women host 
serious danger. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, we're good feminists. Um, yeah, this is the, the this is the fam episode. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, thanks for doing it with thanks us. Thanks for having me. Everyone, remember please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening now. It helps us get the word out. You can share our stuff. Follow us on. Uh, social media we're on twitter instagram tiktok and youtube at serious danger au for all the info head to serious danger pod.com you can email us hello at serious danger pod.com and uh remember there's a bunch of episodes over on patreon if you are thinking about becoming a patron there's heaps of content there and it really helps us keep the show going chuck us three bucks a month if you want to do that and is there any where, where can folks follow what you're doing amy they could follow me on facebook if you just Search Amy yep. McMahon and it's a M-A-C, so you don't get M-A-C. confused. Um, also <laughs> on um, Twitter, I think I'm uh, Amy Mac South Breeze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or on Instagram if you want some pretty pictures of the electorate. And TikTok. Uh, not and to, TikTok, to but dump yes. Look at TikTok, but, but I was looking at your TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's, I think I forgot, there's one that we made together yeah, in yeah, Parliament yeah, yeah. talking about yes. like Dixes versus yeah. actual questions, which I was yeah. laughing at our own TikTok. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the, the, my most successful TikTok is actually the one that you made of, um, of you and Tom talking about the uh, the renters' <laughs> oh, debate and telling, right, telling the landlords to, yeah, telling the landlords <laughs> to, to get out of Parliament. Yeah, which they didn't as it do. should be. Yeah. That one went nuts. All mm, right, mm. Amy, Queen of Queensland Parliament. Thanks for, Thank for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Cheers. This is a serious danger to Australia.